Hi. We're going to talk about Greek myth. I prefer the word myth to mythology. There is no reason to use the word mythology. Uh, mythology is the study of myth. What we're, uh, I'm going to ta tell you about Greek myths, not about Greek mythology. That doesn't make sense. It's an irritating uh, misnomer, uh, I think. Uh, I'll explain why uh, I'm able to do this and a couple of other things. Uh, Dr. Shin and I did uh, an autobiographical uh, tape or two, I know, but um, I'll, I'll explain something. Um, when I taught for University of Maryland for many years, uh, I used to do what was called uh, Greek myth, Greek mythology. Uh, that was the name of a weekend seminar. Now, this meant that a student could take the course which lasted from Saturday morning to Saturday, nine o'clock Saturday morning, let's say, to five. And then Sunday, uh, nine to five, also in theory. For me, the course ended Sunday morning, so I taught all day Saturday and plus Sunday morning, and then Sunday afternoon was the test. Uh, and they were free to go after the test. Uh, it was it was great for me. I probably I did it eight to ten times, uh, so that I could do it uh, quite naturally. The way I can tell talk about myth here uh, is a result of that. Of course, it cost me some effort to put that together, uh, and um, but I developed a sequence so that I didn't really need notes or anything, and that's why I'm able to do that here. I haven't done that, I guess, for. Uh, hmm, over 13 years, but uh, of course I've done portions of it uh, in my high school, especially AP English class. Generally, uh, the reason why I'm able to uh, talk about things at great length is that I've taught them many times, uh, especially for Maryland. Uh, Maryland was such a wonderful thing for me uh, because uh, the program allowed me to teach a great variety of courses. The only criterion was whether enough students would uh, enroll in the class or not. And I had a kind of following, uh, so uh, usually my courses went, as we said, that is, happened. Uh, and uh, because I was able to request courses, uh, I requested things that I wanted to know more about, uh, prepared them, and uh, so it was wonderful. Anyway, quick myth. Um, this is the kind of tape, I mean, I'm just going to be telling story after story after story. Uh, I hope that you, anyone watching this tape, uh, we'll be able to watch it uh, slowly uh, and repeatedly. If you can absorb this stuff, uh, then you will know a lot of Greek myth. Uh, I have no idea how many names I'll mention, but uh, 50, 100, I, I don't know. Uh, the spelling is sometimes difficult. I, by the way, I made that spelling list. Okay? Okay, here we go. I like to begin, it's good to have a map, by the way. Um, I won't hold up a map, that's too awkward in our, in our situation, but uh, it's good for you, the student, to have a map, uh, to know that region a little bit. The region would be uh, Greece and the Aegean, A-E-G-E-A-N, the Aegean Sea. Uh, that's the area of the myths. Okay. I like to begin in what is called Lydia, was called Lydia, excuse me. Lydia was in Asia Minor. Always Asia Minor means Turkey. Uh, but before there was Turkey, there was Asia Minor. Um, Central um, Asia Minor, let's say. This myth, the myth that I'll begin with, um, is an ancient one. Uh, we can tell from uh, certain things about it. The mingling of, the, uh, of humans with gods, for example. That's a sign of a quite early myth. From time to time, I'll try to stop 
and make references to what kinds of myths we're talking about, because there are various kinds of myths, and there are theories of myths, too, what myth is. Uh, in my opinion, uh, and I follow G.S. Kirk here, who is, I think, the expert from Cambridge, um, there are so many uh, various kinds of myths that it's best, I, I think, it's best to see myth simply as story. And the word mythos in Greek really just means story. Um, I haven't started yet, I know, but um, be aware that uh, the word myth is used, the word myth is an important word in, of the past 50 years, I would say. A very important word. Uh, and for me personally, it's very important. Uh, the word is used in popular culture, oh, that's just a myth, meaning that's a lie, a fabrication, un untruth. Uh, that, of course, goes too far. Uh, at its best, a myth can be a very profound exploration of a question. For example, in Genesis, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that is a profound and great myth. Uh, I better explain what I mean, um, even before we get into Greek myth. Uh, that is a great myth because it explores, I would say, uh, I've never... I would say it explores a question. Uh, the question is, why is it that we human beings feel alienated from cut off from uh, God, from nature, uh, from our fellow man, and from our very selves. We, no doubt, we feel cut off from all these things. No one, no human being can be totally at peace with any of those four things. God, uh, nature, our fellow man, and ourselves. Uh, this is kind of existentialist language, I guess, but uh, doesn't matter. That is definitely true, and this myth explores that. Well, that's profound. Uh, the myth supposes that at one point we were at peace with, in harmony with God, nature, our fellow man, and ourselves, but that harmony was ruptured, that harmony was uh, shattered by some event, uh, and so the myth grows out of this kind of thinking, well, that's as profound, as excellent. Uh, when myth can do that, uh, it goes beyond just story. Greek myth sometimes reaches something like that, but uh, as Kirk, who is vastly uh, learned on the subject, uh, says, uh, Greek myth very, mostly does not reach such profundity. Uh, the stories are good, and because they're Greek, they have come to dominate Western culture. But it's not because of some supposed uh, vast superiority of Greek myth to the myths of other cultures, because that superiority probably doesn't exist. That's a, just to remind us, there are lots of myths, uh, mythic systems or um, cultures that have produced uh, myths, and some of them Greek. Uh, in my opinion, the measure a measure of greatness, uh, of the greatness I at least uh, am looking for, is that Genesis myth of Adam and Eve. Um, it doesn't get, myth cannot do better than that, I think. Okay, beginning in Lydia. There was a king, Tantalus, Tantalus, uh, of Lydia, and he was friendly with the gods, and the gods were friendly with him. And occasionally he would dine with the gods. The gods would dine with him. One day the gods were had been invited to dine with him. Unaccountably, because no explanation in the myth, I like that too. No explanation. That's like Homer. Uh, he doesn't explain. Unaccountably, Tantalus took his son... Pelops, we don't know how old Pelops was, but small, must have been three, four, killed his son and cut him up into little pieces and put his, put him into the stew, I like to say stew, 
that uh, Tantalus was serving the gods. The gods arrived. Most of the gods were aware that human flesh was in the stew and were uh, were uh, repulsed. One god, though, was inattentive to this, and that was Demeter. Demeter. <coughs> She, in the well-known myth, had lost her daughter, Persephone, was absent-minded, depressed, and inattentively ate some of the stew, I like to say. Okay, two things happened. First, uh, the gods put little Pelops back together. He was missing a shoulder, though. Demeter had eaten the shoulder. So Poseidon supplied an ivory shoulder, a beautiful ivory shoulder, uh, implied in the myth is that thereafter Poseidon kind of adopted uh, Pelops uh, and uh, where the Greeks are concerned this can be pretty naughty uh, uh, that is uh, don't know I won't play with that right yet but later maybe second uh, um, consequence was that the gods put Tantalus in Hades halls that is what we say hell, but that, that's not quite the point. Now this is a sign of something later, because at first Hades Halls was not a punitive measure, that is, it was not a place of rewards and punishments. The gods had no, uh, the Greeks had no notion early, I think, of rewards and punishment. But here we have a clear instance of punishment. Tantalus was placed in a pool of water, over his head were branches of fruits. When Tantalus was thirsty, he reached for the water, it disappeared. When he was hungry, he reached for the fruit, it disappeared. Hence we have the word to tantalize. To tantalize is to dangle something in front of someone, and when someone reaches for the thing, pull it away. Um, so. That's a great first myth, and it is one of the better ones. What's going on? The student, of course, wants to know, why would Tantalus do such a horrible thing? Uh, the myth does not provide the explanation, but the explanation, I think, is pretty clear, or at least the only one I can see, and that is that Tantalus was angry at the gods, uh, wanted to humiliate or taint or somehow belittle the gods. Why? Because the gods are immortal and man is mortal. The gods are immortal and man is mortal. Is that reason to be angry at the gods? According to the myth, yes. Uh, and I think maybe it's got a, it's a very good point. It's an excellent point. I don't see any other explanation. Okay. Pelops grew up. He would become a king, a powerful king. But he was young. He was when he was a young man. He was bored, I think, and he wanted adventure. Now, far away in the Peloponnese, the Peloponnese is the lower peninsula of Greece, connected to mainland Greece only by the Isthmus of Corinth, where Corinth is, Corinth of New Testament fame. Okay. Uh, in the western corner, northwestern corner of uh, the Peloponnese lies Elis, E-L-I-S. The king of Elis, difficult name, Oinomaeus, O-E-N-O-M-A-U-S. Important name? No. I try to tell students which names are really important. Um, okay. Oinomaeus had a daughter, Hippodamea, spelled just like it sounds. Uh, beautiful maybe, and he was perhaps inordinately, perhaps improperly even, fond of his daughter. But it's fairly common. Some fathers do not like the idea of marrying their daughters off to some male, perhaps because they know and understand males. Excuse me? Okay, so... Oinomaeus had made a rule that the prince, had to be a prince, who would marry his daughter would have to defeat him in a chariot race. He had a very good chariot and very good horses. 
He even had a charioteer named Myrtilus, M-Y-R-T-I-L-U-S. Myrtilus was the son of Hermes. Wow. Okay. But Pelops had some very good horses too because Pelops was the favorite, uh, perhaps the minion, I used that word the other day, of Poseidon. And Poseidon is the lord of horses. Poseidon, one of Poseidon's traits is that he is the god of horses, suggesting male virility, male strength, male fertility even. So Pelops had some very good horses. But he wanted a sure thing. By the way, the princes who had lost the chariot races previously uh, had lost their heads as well, and their heads were arranged on a wall there, twelve heads, always twelve, magic twelve in myth, three, twelve, these classical numbers, which to me as to their charm, but when when we unconsciously let these numbers uh, dominate our thinking, I think it's kind of silly. Uh, it, it's a level of superstition, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, so Pelops wanted to be sure. He contacted Myrtilus, the charioteer, and he said, Look, Myrtilus, I want to win this race. What will you do? Uh, what shall I do for you to get you to help me? And Myrtilus said, he wanted to spend the first night, the wedding night, with the bride. Whoa! But Pelops unflinchingly said, No problem. Okay. I love to tell this myth. So, what Myrtilus did was he changed the linchpin, a pin necessary to the connecting of the chariot to the horse, the braces. A linchpin was normally iron, even by that time. Changed it to wax. Well, wax in the heat of the race would melt, especially at the key turning point, because the chariot, the tr the track was a an, a very oblong, extreme oblong, elongated uh, course, uh, and the race normally was out and back, and the course be, could be as long as a mile, let's say. Uh, but the key was that dramatic. Uh, 180 degree turn. At that point, the linchpin would melt, the chariot, the horses would go one way, the chariot would go the, another way with tremendous force, he would be killed. Almost certainly. That's exactly what happens. Oinomaeus, the king, is killed. Uh, so, Pelops is going to marry Hippodamea. He marries her. And then, after the wedding, Myrtilus comes to Pelops and says, uh, Do you remember your promise? Sure, Myrtilus. Come on over here. I want to talk with you. He takes him to an edge of a cliff, picks him up, and throws him off the cliff. Myrtilus dies. But before he dies, he puts a curse on Pelops and on the house of Pelops. And most curses in Greek myth and literature are effective. One reason why curses are so effective, by the way, is the fear, if the culture believes in them, then the fear of the object of the curse is a powerful uh, force in the realization of the uh, curse. Okay, so Myrtilus, remember, son of Hermes, goes down to his death, but that curse is around. Pelops and Hippodamea produce two sons, and they are important. Atreus, A-T-R-E-U-S, and Thyestes, T-H-Y-E-S-T-E-S. -E -E These brothers grow up. Now, Myrtilus, it seems, has a little relationship on the side with a nameless nymph, with an anonymous nymph. Uh, the nymph with the nymph, though, he produces another son, Chrysippos. Chrysippos grows up as a beautiful boy and his father's favorite. Um, now, I'm going to tell a story that links the basically the Argive. There are two main cycles in Greek myth. The Argive cycle, which has to do with the Peloponnese, which we've been much uh, involved in, and the Theban cycle, T-H-E-B-A-N, <coughs> They're equally important. The 
these two cycles of myths seldom contact each other. Twice, once for our purposes, they contact each other significantly. And so I'm going to interrupt my Argive tales with this tale of Theban because this is the time for it. Uh, the prince of Thebes at this time was uh, Laius, L-A-I-U-S, let's say, young man. He wanted to visit Elis, where we are, Pelops. Don't know why, but this was common among royalty especially. They all knew each other. They visited each other. Many times they were relatives. Laius visited Elis. Laius, young man, 20, 22, saw Chrysippos, the beautiful boy, just had to have him, abducted him, kidnapped, it, kidnapped him, and on the chariot. Pelops uh, knew that this had happened, uh, pursued, and of course Pelops has the great horses, Pelops overtook uh, Laius, took his boy back, Chrysippos, and put a huge curse on Laius. And the curse went like this. May you never have a son, or if you do ever have a son, may he kill you. This is the origin, for those of you who know it, uh, this is the origin of the uh, Oedipus myths. Because, of course, Laos will have a son, Oedipus. And, of course, that son will kill him. The efficacy of these curses is an interesting feature of myths. Uh, so that the student, when the student sees someone curse someone, the student can be pretty sure that curse will come true, uh, that curse will be effective. Uh, the Greeks and most uh, primitive or semi-primitive cultures literally thought the curse, when, when the words of a curse were uttered, those words assumed a shape, became kind of like a deity, a, a spirit anyway, and that spirit pursued the object of the curse. So they took curses pretty seriously. Back to our Argive cycle, back to Ellis. The boys grow up. Hippodamea, the queen, hates Chrysippos. But a caution here. In Greek myth, we seldom see what we call sexual jealousy. That is, the wife who hates the rival. Uh, sexual jealousy, romantic love has very little to do with these royal weddings. Uh, love even has very little to do with them. After all, these royal royal matches were were contracts made uh, formally between states, uh, much more formal than uh, than arranged marriages in Korea, for example. Uh, the wills of the participants were hardly even consulted. Um, anyway, uh, well, sometime I would like to linger on that pelops Hippodamea marriage, uh, because it began heatedly enough. Uh, Pelops wanted to marry her, wanted to have her, uh, but certainly it did not end well. Okay, Hippodamea hates Chrysippos. Why then? Mainly because she thinks that Pelops will make Chrysippos the next king. And that means her two sons are out. Uh, and if she's still alive, she's out too. That's why. So she persuades her sons to kill Chrysippos. So Atreus and Thyestes kill Chrysippos. Of course, Pelops is heartbroken by this. Uh, and he banishes his two sons. By the way, obviously, I would say, the curse of Myrtilus has come true. Uh, Pelops is now a broken man. He has lost his favorite son, he has lost his, his only sons, and he can just grow old with this wife who must detest him, as he probably detests her. That curse was a pretty good curse. Okay, meanwhile, Atreus and uh, Thyestes wander because they've been banished. They wander in the direc direction of Argos, Argos is more or less in the center, uh, off to the eastern side of the Peloponnese. Near Argos was a probably a village, a small town, but the small town needed a king. Hey.
And so Thiestes, Atreus and Thiestes, went to the town and said, Hi, we're princes, we can be your kings. They say, we only want one king, how shall we choose? Whichever one of you can do the best tricks can be our king. So, uh, now the story gets complicated, but this is important. And I realize this can go on for many hours now. I see my pace here. Maybe I'm talking in too much detail. We'll see. Okay, so, Atreus was married. His wife was Aerope. Not important. A-E-R-O-P-E. -E. Atreus had some golden fleece, which he had uh, received from Hermes. Well, this means that that curse of Myrtilus is still working, I would say. Uh, golden fleece. So, uh, who can do the best trick? Atreus pulls out, or he says, I can show you some golden fleece. Wow, show us. He goes to his bedroom, looks under the bed, or whatever, for the box. The box isn't there. Thiestes says, no, 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 no. He's lying. I have the golden fleece, and he shows the golden fleece. Hooray! Thiestes, he's our king. Atreus, angry. What happened? It seems that the wife of Atreus, Erope, has been having a love affair with her brother-in-law, Thiestes. She betrayed her husband, stole the golden fleece, and wow! Of course, Atreus is angry, and he complains bitterly to Zeus. Zeus says, okay, okay, it's not fair. Uh, tell them you can do a better trick yet. You can stop the sun for 24 hours in the sky. Stop. I can stop the sun for 24 hours in the sky. Okay. Boom. The sun stops. Atreus is our king. Hooray! Atreus is our king. Now Thiestes is out. Atreus banishes his brother. But he gets to thinking, wait a minute. Banishment, that's too soft. I want to really punish him. So he invites his brother back for a reconciliation. They will make up. All is forgiven. And let's have a feast. And they have a great feast. In the stew, Atreus cuts up the two sons of Thiestes and puts them in the stew. This happens three times, in important times in Greek myth. Don't think that it happens that often. But already in half an hour, we, you've seen it twice. Thiestes eats his stew. Then, only afterwards, Atreus says, By the way, what, what, wasn't that meat delicious? Yeah, what was it? Your sons. Ah! Moment of horror, which will have huge consequences. And Thiestes curses his brother. This is the feast of Atreus, famous in myth, and the curse of Atreus, which was also famous in myth. Uh, and it will be felt especially by the sons of Atreus, especially by the son Agamemnon. Uh, okay. So, then uh, Thiestes, who is still alive, wanders. And now a very strange part of the myth, but it's important because it provides something for a later myth. He wanders around a kind of broken man, um, or at least uh, at a loss. He comes to woods, and in the woods he finds a stream, and there some beautiful girls are bathing. Now this is some years later, some years have passed. Well, it turns out that one of the girls is left alone there while the others disappear. Thiestes rapes this girl. This girl turns out to have been a daughter of Thiestes. Well, this is incest. He didn't recognize her. He didn't know it. Um, it's a very complicated story, and I won't go into that, but that's what happened. She becomes pregnant, produces a son. His name is Aegisthos. <coughs> now, in a couple of days, we will start the uh, Odyssey. Aegisthos is important right away in Book 1 in the Odyssey. Uh, and he's very important in one of the most important myths, uh, the death of Agamemnon. So I have reasons for telling you this story. 
Aegisthus will grow up, he's a son of Theestes, uh, he will grow up hating Atreus, his uncle. Why? Because of the terrible thing that Atreus did to father Theestes. Okay, so must remember that name, Aegisthos. A-I or A-E, doesn't matter, G-I-S-T-H-O-S, or U-S. In Greek, it, the endings, the alphabet is different, remember, but O is O, uh, Omicron, small O. Uh, but the O-S ending is very often changed to U-S because the Romans changed it to more congenial to them, U-S. So I mix them up, and I think it uh, doesn't really matter. O-S, U-S, uh, choose ad libitum, uh, as you like. Uh, okay, so, um, Atreus. Atreus then uh, produces uh, two sons himself, Agamemnon and Menelaus. And these are, of course, hugely important in the Iliad, which we have done. Uh, and they are both important in the Odyssey too. They both appear uh, in important ways in the Odyssey too. So this is important stuff. Okay, uh, these boys grow up. Agamemnon is the uh, older or elder brother. Now we shift for a moment. We shift to Sparta, heart of um, the Peloponnese. But Sparta was not important at this time. The young king of Sparta is Tyndareos, T-Y-N-D-A-R-E-O-S. He marries a princess, Leda, L-E-D-A, important. All the, I'm only telling important myths. Um, okay, Zeus, that Zeus, I must discuss sometimes why, sometime why Zeus is presented this way, but I will save that for later. Zeus... Um, wants Leda. Leda is already pregnant uh, by her husband, by her, her young husband. Leda is bathing in the woods too <laughs> with her maids uh, in a stream. Along comes a swan, a beautiful swan, kind of a big swan maybe. I love to enact this in a classroom. Quack, 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 quack. Here, swan. Oh, cute swan. Quack, quack, quack. Swan rapes her. <laughs> Classes love that. <laughs> Just the image of the swan raping the girl is absurd enough, I admit, but that's the story. Uh, the swan is Zeus. Zeus disguises as himself as a swan, that rascal. He will stoop to terrible depths <laughs> to achieve his lust. Okay, he rapes Leda. Now Leda is carrying two eggs. That's how it's depicted in literature. Two eggs, the Zeus egg and the Tyndareus egg. The Zeus egg contains one girl and one boy, the other one also. We are concerned mainly with the girls. The Zeus egg girl is Helen, the future Helen of Troy, now Helen of Sparta. The Tyndareus egg contains Clytemnestra, C-L-Y-T-E-M-N-E-S-T-R-A. These two are very important. They grow up. Uh, Helen is, of course, beautiful, and that's where the myth probably came from. Uh, she's so beautiful, her father must be Zeus. Uh, anyway, she grew up and became marriageable. Tyndareus had an idea, because when she became marriageable, all the princes of the Greek world came to Sparta. They wanted her, wanted to marry her. So Tyndareus made them all promise that if anyone ever tried to steal Helen from her husband, after she had a husband, then the others would promise to restore her to her husband. They all swore. This is key, because this will be the making of the Trojan War. Then she chose Menelaus. My God, Menelaus? Why? Well, cynical people like to think that beautiful women uh, in, almost invariably choose mediocre males. Uh, true, I'm not so sure it's true, it's a consolation for, for uh, the males whom 
she doesn't, whom they don't choose, perhaps. Okay, so Helen of Sparta marries Menelaus of Argos. Clytemnestra, her sister, marries Agamemnon of Argos. So two brothers marry two sisters. Hugely important, uh, and it's easy to remember. So Menelaus settles in Sparta, he as kind of the king of Sparta. Clytemnestra goes to Argos to be the wife of Agamemnon, the older brother, who of course became the king of Argos. Vast wealth, vast power. These were Mycenaean kings. Mycenaean, the Mycenaean Empire was very important. It was the second of the Greek empires. The first, the earliest, was the Minoan, but that was in Crete, and that fell to the Mycenaean. Mycenaean is named after Mycenae, see the map, north of Argos, M-Y-C-E-N-A-E. -E. The Mycenaean, same way, add an, another A-N, empire, was historical, and Agamemnon is probably historical. Okay, now what's happening? Now, to put the third piece of this puzzle together, we must shift to Troy, northern Asia Minor. Troy was real. Schliemann discovered it, the, the great uh, archaeologist and scholar, discovered Troy, uh, and uh, established that the Trojan War probably took place, probably in 1150 or 1200 BC, BCE. Okay, we shift to Troy. Troy is very powerful, very wealthy. Uh, in fact, Troy really is the rival in the eastern Mediterranean of the Mycenaean Empire, and that would be reason enough for the war to take place. Uh, situated near the entrance to the Black Sea. Uh, Troy controlled all of that region uh, and great wealth. Okay, what happened? The king of Troy was Priam, his wife Hecuba. They produced many sons, and, he and Priam, Eastern harem style, had uh, concubines on the side and produced many sons that way too. Okay. Uh, I would say the fifth or sixth son was probably Paris. When Paris was born, a prophet in Troy had a dream. And in that dream, in the foreground, a little baby was crying, Paris apparently, and in the background, Troy was burning, Troy was destroyed. The meaning of the dream seemed quite clear. This baby will somehow produce the end, the destruction of Troy. What shall we do? Well, to kill him outright, we run into this again and again in Greek myth. The reason why there are two reasons why uh, they don't kill the babies outright. For example, Oedipus later. One, royalty. Killing royalty is uh, uh, is a dangerous business. Zeus will be unhappy. Two, killing kindred blood. Then the Furies get involved. The Furies will punish the person who kills kindred blood. So what they do is put the baby out on the mountain. Well, in this case, they didn't even do that. They decided, no, we can't kill this baby. We're going to send the baby to Mount Ida, 50 miles, 80 kilometers away, Mount Ida. And the baby will grow up there as a shepherd, not knowing that that baby is a prince of mighty Troy. Okay. So little Paris is sent to Mount Ida and grows up as a shepherd. But Paris grows up uh, to be a very handsome shepherd, uh, and in myth he's the, the most handsome male in the world. Okay, now the fourth piece of this puzzle, because we are putting, we're going to put them all together. Um, Zeus. Zeus was told by Prometheus whose name actual, actually means foreknowledge, F-O-R-E, that is, he can foresee the future, that if he had relations with a certain mortal or goddess, that the offspring would be more powerful than he was. Well, he was alarmed by this. He tried to force Prometheus to tell him who this person, this female was, 
Prometheus wouldn't tell him. And so uh, he tortured Prometheus, blah, blah, blah. In the end, Prometheus told him, Don't touch Thetis, T-H-E-T-I-S. Thetis was a minor sea goddess, actually, a Nereid, N-E-R-E-I-D, son of Nereus, a sea, old man of the sea kind of guy. So, Zeus, to be safe, married Thetis off to a mortal chief or warrior, Peleus, P-E-L-E-U-S, uh, because that way he could be sure that the offspring would not be a threat to him. Okay, the wedding of Peleus and Thetis was a, f a famous affair because the gods attended and the most famous mortals attended too. Uh, Heracles was there, Hercules, and many others. Okay, uh, the one who was not invited was the goddess of discord, that is, squabbling, fighting, Eris, E-R-I-S. She was not invitus, invited, so in the myth she was angry. She made a golden apple, and on the golden apple she wrote, To the fairest, to the most beautiful, and she threw the apple into the wedding hall, let's say. Hera says, I'm the fairest, it must be for me. Athena says, no, 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 I'm the fairest, it must be for me. Aphrodite says, no, 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 I'm the fairest, it must be for me. Zeus, you decide. Zeus, no, not me, I'm not going to get involved in this. You must go to the, submit this question to the uh, most handsome male in the world, and that's Paris, that shepherd boy at Mount Ida. So this wonderful scene that uh, several Renaissance painters painted, the judgment of Paris, takes place. Hermes, the guide, guides the three goddesses to Mount Ida, summons Paris, and Paris is to make this uh, decision. Now, Paris is mortal. So he can't see the goddesses as they are. Instead, they must basically bribe him with qualities that they are with gifts. Hera promises the young man uh, political power, that is, he will be a great king. Athena promises him military glory. He will be a great warrior fighter. And Aphrodite promises him the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, the choice will tell us a lot about Paris. What kind of guy is he? What does he want? He chooses Aphrodite. That is, he chooses pleasure. Um, sexual pleasure and pleasure. Well, Athena and Hera will never forgive Paris, will never forgive Troy. They will make sure that Troy is destroyed. Now, this is the mythical version of how it came about that Troy would be destroyed. Uh, but Homer uses this in the Iliad. Uh, remember, though, that Homer doesn't take the gods seriously at all in the Iliad. Uh, and my own view is that, assuming the common authorship of the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, the Iliad, and everyone agrees with this, the Iliad is the younger man's poem, but the younger man did not take the gods seriously. And I think this needs some clarifying. Uh, we talk about Homer being the teacher of the gods. Uh, that is, Homer being the Bible of the Greeks. Uh, but unless you can interpret these myths allegorically, uh, symbolically, it's absurd to think of the Iliad as teaching religion in, on any level. It's absolutely absurd. In a few days, when I talk about the Odyssey, I'll show you that the Odyssey is seriously religious. Uh, the older Homer, uh, I think, did take religion seriously, and I'll show you how. And I think in this way it's profound, but the Iliad is, is silly, uh, or really satirical, scornful. Back to our story. Okay, so Aphrodite is going to keep her promise. Who is the most beautiful woman in the world? Helen. But Helen is married in Sparta. No problem. So first, Aphrodite takes Paris to Troy because she explains to him, you are a prince of Troy. Uh, they arrive in Troy. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. 
I'm Paris. Remember the one you sent to be a shepherd? <laughs> guilt. Parental guilt. And that's an important and interesting aspect of the myth. So when Paris says, I want a ship with lots of rich things on it and lots of sailors, of course, uh, Priam and Hecuba will give, grant him his wish. Why? Guilt. Uh, should they feel guilty? I guess so. The myth is an excellent myth in the sense that everything fits together very well. Uh, that's one mark of an uh, excellent myth, one criterion. Not the best, but it's interesting. So, of course they provide the ship. Paris sails to Sparta. Uh, arrives at Sparta. He's a rich, handsome prince. Of course they will welcome him uh, and uh, ho be his host. At this moment, Aphrodite is at work, too. She makes sure that Menelaus is called out of town on business. So that means Paris and Helen are left alone there in Sparta to play. I would say it's pretty obvious. Uh, the Odyssey will make this clear, I'll show you, especially Book 4 of the Odyssey. Par it, Helen really was a superior woman. Uh, she is in the Odyssey. Is Odyssey? She is excellent. She's intelligent, and in the Iliad too, no one blames her for anything, uh, nor should she be blamed. I think, and she's married to a mediocrity because Menelaus, sorry, is a mediocrity. Uh, so this handsome young prince who is so passionate uh, because he will be, uh, she can't resist, and she runs away with him. She leaves her husband and daughter, Hermione. H-E-R-M-I-O-N-E, -E, a little important later, and runs off with Paris to Troy. In some versions of the myth, she's forced. You choose. The, diff the distinction is not important. In any case, off she goes to Troy. Menelaus returns home. Dear, dear, <laughs> I'm home. No, no wife. Well... He remembers the promise, and we have to remember it too, that was made by all the Greek princes. If this happened, they would all get together to win her back. Menelaus is in no position to enforce that promise, but his brother Agamemnon is. So he goes to his brother Agamemnon in Argos and says, Look, here's what's happened. Uh, I want her back. You help me get the princes of Greece all together to win her back. Agamemnon loves this idea, and this is a little important too, because Agamemnon, who has everything, he is a an emperor, does not have military glory, and he wants military glory. And here's the moment for his dream. If he can lead the expedition against Troy and win that war, he will win military glory, and that's just what he wants. Uh, excellent myth, excellent, psychologically excellent. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. Uh, that's a good way to put it. Psychologically excellent myth. Uh, okay, so a couple of attempts are made to prevent war. I think I've told you this before in telling you about uh, the uh, Iliad. Um, in Book 3 of the Iliad, uh, we hear about this. Menelaus and Odysseus go to Troy to try to prevent war. And Menelaus speaks, and then Odysseus speaks, and his words fell like snow, snowflakes. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so, attempts are made, but unsuccessful. There will be a war. Uh, Agamemnon goes around gathering the Greeks, and there are a couple of little myths uh, that are interesting about how uh, two especially, Odysseus and um, Achilles, the two greatest really, tried to avoid going on this silly war, because really the war is silly. What has happened here? A woman left her husband. Is this cause for a war? No. Uh, and they know it will be a long war, uh, but they're caught because all the pieces of this puzzle fit together pretty well, I think. Okay, Agamemnon goes to get Odysseus. Odysseus feigns madness, F-E-I-G-N, pretends to be crazy. 
Now, he has recently uh, gotten married to Penelope. They have a young son, so they've been married for a year or two. He certainly doesn't want to go off to Troy. He feigns madness, but Agamemnon, with the help of uh, Palamedes, name not too important, uh, tricks Odysseus, because Odysseus, uh, to show that he was crazy, was plowing in the field, but he would sow salt in the field. Uh, well, nothing will grow from salt. Uh, in fact, it will kill uh, the fertility of the land. But they put the baby, Telemachus, in front of the horse, and when Odysseus, I mean, if he's crazy, he'll just keep going. But if he's not crazy, and they know he's not crazy, he will stop, he stops, he's caught, Odysseus will join them. The second famous myth, Achilles. Achilles' mother, Thetis, of course, knows what will happen. And she wants desperately to keep Achilles away from that war. Now, she should know better, uh, because she can foresee the gods' will, but at least she wants to do something to prevent, to try to prevent her son from going off to Troy, where he will certainly die. So, she dresses her son up as a girl and makes him one of the uh, maids of a princess on Skyros, uh, the island of Skyros. What's her name? don't remember. Anyway, Agamemnon arrives there. They suspect a trick. So, they bring gifts for all the women. Perfume, jewelry, women's robes, all that sort of thing. But they also bring a sword and a shield, weapons. The women all go for the womenly things, but Achilles, who is beautiful, in disguise, goes for the armor. They've got him. He's Achilles, you devil. So, that's how those two famous men, Odysseus and Achilles, are caught and are hailed into the war. I'll tell one other myth that we'll go a little over because we started late. Um... Okay, so everyone is scheduled to gather at Aulis, A-U-L-I-S. If you look on the map, it's on the eastern coast of Greece, uh, but it's protected by that long island, uh, uh, Euboia, I think. Anyway, uh, everyone meets there. A thousand ships, 55 to 60,000 men. Pretty large expedition, famous. Everyone gathers there, but no wind. The wind doesn't blow. Days, weeks. The men are bored. They gamble and play. Uh, they start to fight even. Terrible situation. Agamemnon, desperate, asks Kalkas, and we'll hear him again and again, uh, Well, in the, uh, in the Iliad, uh, I spell K-A-L-C-H-A-S, or C. K or C, doesn't matter. Greek. Okay, Kalkas, what's wrong here? Why doesn't the wind blow? Well, Kalkas explains that 16 years earlier, when Agamemnon and Clytemnestra were expecting their final child, a daughter, Ag uh, Clytemnestra was having terrible trouble in the pregnancy. So Agamemnon had promised to Artemis to sacrifice to Artemis the most beautiful animal born that year. Uh, Artemis, sacred, uh, the protectress of animals. Artemis also helps with pregnancy. So, Artemis helps, the baby is born, Iphigenia. I-P-H-I-G-E-N-E-I-A. Beautiful name, Iphigenia. Uh, she's born, uh, and Agamemnon sacrifices a beautiful fawn, a beautiful deer, born that year to Artemis. Sixteen years have passed. Now, Kalkas explains that Artemis is angry because the most beautiful animal born that year was Iphigenia. Well, that's beautiful. That's, uh, that's an interesting thing. Animal or creature, let's say. So, if you want the wind to blow, Agamemnon, you will have to sacrifice your daughter. Well, this is, a, this is almost a great myth, I think, because when a myth explores uh, experience that we are familiar with, uh, sensi with sensitivity and insight, 
I think that qualifies as a pretty good myth. And it seems to me what's being explored here is, okay, here is a father who will sacrifice his child basically for his career. Have fathers sacrificed their children for their careers? Definitely. Many, many, many. Um, I think that makes this myth relevant uh, because we our first reaction is, oh, Agamemnon, you monster, sacrifice your child. But really, really it happens fairly often. Um, so, how can we do this? Uh, Agamemnon sends a message to Clytemnestra back in Argos at home. Dear, dear, good news. Achilles wants to marry Iphigenia. Now 16, let's say. Come, come to Aulis. Iphigenia and uh, her mother Clytemnestra come to Aulis for this happy occasion. But of course, Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter, according to the myth, and this was terrible. For the Greeks even, this was terrible. Iphigenia, crushed, betrayed, furious, will never rest until she punishes her husband for this terrible thing. Why did Agamemnon do this? That's how desperate he is to achieve military fame and glory. Terrible myth, but striking. Iphigenia, uh, uh, Iphigenia is dead. Clytemnestra, the mother, goes back to Argos uh, to, to ponder how she can punish her husband. She will wait for those ten years until her husband comes back. And psychologically, one of the most interesting parts of all these myths is Agamemnon's awareness of what awaits him when he goes back. And really, I think, although he hesitates to go back, he goes back, what can he do? And I think he goes back knowing, expecting to die. <coughs> and part of him, I think, is willing to accept that. Uh, he knows he deserves to die, really. Psychologically, that's the way it's told in Aeschylus' great play, Agamemnon, which tells this story. Okay, so uh, the... Greek army sails off to Troy to begin the Trojan War, which would last for ten years. That's a good place for us to stop.